Hello, and welcome to another edition of Critical Q&A, the show where I answer your questions based on what you've left for me in the comments section of my Q&A videos or have sent to me by email at askchrisshelton at gmail.com. All right, so I did a Thursday video this week, and it was on Scientology's policy letter called Public Image. And in this video, I cover some of the relationships between psychiatry and psychology and Scientology, uh, some of the, the, the policy on how Scientology uh, delusionally thinks that it's taking over the field of mental healing, and uh, various other things. So if you'll check that video out, it's about 20 minutes or so, and I think it'll be worth your time. And I also did a podcast this week that I am very happy with. And unfortunately, it's going to be one of those ones that doesn't get watched by a whole lot of people because it's not <laughs> directly related to Scientology. But it is, but it's not as far as anybody's concerned. But anyway, it, it deals with the subject of free will. And it gets into a lot of what I've been studying recently about where this whole process has been taking me in terms of studying uh, you know, a lot of these different fields that I kind of go on and on about, so I'm not going to keep going on and on about it, but um, the fruit of all that labor <laughs> is sort of reflected in a lot of what I talked about in this podcast this week. So uh, I thought I'd throw that out there, and, uh, you know, the thing about this, and the great thing about it, is that, um, you know, learning results in expanding your views, looking at more possibilities, seeing more causes and reasons for things, and opens up doors for uh, understanding in ways that you just don't know until you know something. You know, that's one of the things I love about learning. And for people who follow me and follow my channel, you know that I'm a pretty introspective person and I really enjoy the process of acquiring new knowledge and passing it on. And I try to do that in the most constructive and entertaining way that I know how. Um, and I hope that you guys will come along with me for the new part of where this all is going uh, as I continue to relate it to Scientology and destructive cults, of course, uh, but because that's really the underlying theme of all the work. But it is tending now to go in this direction of maybe some of this work and maybe some of this learning can not just be talking about abuses and all the negatives, negativity of all of this, but maybe there's, you know, some bright sides to this too, and maybe there's some things we can learn about all this that will move us all in a better direction. So, that all being said, thank you very much for listening to my little tirade there, and now let's go ahead and answer some of your questions. James Hacker, I follow Stan on Twitter and Taryn Touche just for shits and giggles. A lot of what I hear from the articles they share attempt to portray them as legitimate victims of religious persecution. My initial thought response as a DL Scientology critic is to say that we aren't criticizing your beliefs as much as the abuses that happen within the organization of Scientology. However, the more I think about it, the, I feel like I'm being naive in saying that. Do you think that the very policies about the fair game and financial practices of Scientology is a part of their religious beliefs? Is it silly to try to separate them? No, I don't think it's silly to try to separate them. In fact, for a very long time, I did. When I first started my YouTube channel, I expressly stated that I was not going to be going after the belief system of Scientology or you know, the Xenu narrative and deconstructing that and how ridiculous it is or because, and, and by ridiculous, I don't mean outlandish and hard to believe. I mean ridiculous because actual science and evidence that we have accumulated easily and completely refutes any possibility that what Hubbard proposes is at all realistic or, or even possible. And the reason that's important is because L. Ron Hubbard didn't put the Xenu narrative out there as something to believe. He said this happened. This is a factual account of what occurred in history. But it can't be a factual account of what occurred in our history. So it's not a matter of taking it on faith, right? Or at least that's what you would think. And this is what I've come to learn over the years coming out of Scientology. Um, you know, because I wanted to keep the abuses at first sort of like over here, and this is the bad part, and this is what we need to focus on, this is, the, this is what they need to stop doing. 
But they have this dogma over here with this belief structure of thetans and immortal, you know, immortal spiritual beings and the ARC triangle and the emotional tone scale and all of these bits and pieces that make up the fundamentals of Scientology's beliefs. Well, now I'm deconstructing those too, and it's a, it's a long and rocky and difficult process because I can, it's easy for me to come on here and say, it's all bullshit. And it's easy for you to go, yeah, it's all bullshit. And then we just both shrug and, and then we don't pay any more attention to it. <laughs> I have a kind of a bigger idea. I thought I might try to break it down uh, as to why it's bullshit and very specifically why it's bullshit because Hubbard's assertions are at, it, see this is the crazy thing about Scientology, at once they are faith-based religious dogma and at the same time Hubbard's making claims that they're scientifically um, verified and provable claims and you go, well, is it this or is it this, right? Well, if you start deconstructing it, then the Scientologists or people who want to believe in um, faith-based religion or the people who want to defend the right for people to believe whatever they want will, will, will defend this belief by then going into the faith side. So you break down the scientific nonsense and you show it's all hokum and nonsense and Hubbard had no idea what he was talking about. And then they go, well, it's my beliefs. And what are you doing? Attacking my religious beliefs and you're just a bigot, right? That whole drill goes into play. So, um, so, it's, so, so in a way, I think Scientology and maybe other religions too, to one degree or another, depending on how scientific they try to make the claims of their faith-based dogma, um, suffers from this, this, this problem of having their cake and wanting to eat it too, right? They want to have both ends of this thing. And so I don't think that it's particularly ridiculous at this point to attack and take down and, and ridicule these beliefs um, because they are ridiculous, okay, as I've said. Um, and that's been the effort that I'm now engaged on on this channel. It's been a pretty long-term effort, actually. I've been working on it for the last year. Um, that, you know, that's, I keep talking about all this research I'm doing. Well, that's why I'm doing it. I mean, is, is breaking this stuff down too. That's what got me on all this stuff in the first place. But then after I started learning about it, I started going, oh my God, this has so much more application than just taking apart Scientology's bullshit, right? So that's kind of, uh, how I see it now. It is definitely different than a couple of years ago when I first started my channel. And, uh, and so... I think in terms of engaging with Scientologists on social media or engaging with the Scientology beliefs or ideas that, yeah, I think they're all up for grabs. I think all the, the, the beliefs, the dogma, the abuses, all of it, take it all down, you know. Um, just do so. I mean, it, it, it obviously context matters and your goals matter. So what is it you're trying to do on social media? And if you're trying to change hearts and minds or convince people of things, then you're going to have to do it in a respectful way. Uh, so ridicule and that don't necessarily go hand in hand. So, you know, but it all depends on what path you're trying to, to take. So there you go. Julianne. I'd like to pose a question on behalf of the protesters and people who engage Scientologists on the streets or have Scientologists in their family because I think that could be helpful for them. What questions or phrases would you recommend people using on signs or in a discussion to plant that seed of doubt? What should people have said to you when you were still in Scientology to get you to think about it more critically? Thanks for the question, Julianne, and this is a real good one and uh, an important one. I've said in the past, because I have addressed this before, that there isn't any one-shot question that's going to work for everybody. Again, context matters. You're talking to individuals. Every single person gets into Scientology for their own reasons, and they stay in Scientology for their own reasons. The structure and the authoritarian, you know, dogma and all of that reinforce the beliefs and ideas that the person generates themselves, and that's why they stay, you see. And it gets, I mean, I just sort of another way of putting this is, you know, they get out when they can't sustain those ideas or beliefs anymore. And so what you're asking for are questions or comments or something you can say that will take a direct attack on those things. And that's really hard to do on a broad general basis because of the individuality of everybody's ideas and beliefs. 
That all being said is sort of some whatever kind of disclaimer. I did write some questions down because I thought, well, what would have appealed to me? And what do I think if I was going to go do a protest, would I put on signs? Or if I was going to engage with Scientologists, what questions would I ask them at this point in time, knowing what I know now? And here's what I came up with, just a little list of a couple of them here. Maybe these will be useful for you. Question one, are you happy? Are you getting what you were promised? We're worried about you. Come talk to us. I think that would be specifically for a sign. Uh, but it's a clear invitation, and it expresses worry, not anger or antagonism or ridicule. Uh, are you getting paid enough? It's okay to have doubts. I've seen that sign used many, many times in protests. It's a very good sign. What if Hubbard is wrong? Where's all that expansion? Okay, that's a little bit of a dig, but it's a good one because it speaks to them as Scientologists because the word expansion in Scientology is a key important word. It's used constantly and is constantly reinforced in their messaging that, you know, we are expanding. Scientology, 5.4x expansion, blah, 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 right? Love that word. Why aren't you St. Hill size yet along a similar vein? And your ideal org is awfully empty, isn't it? Now, that's just, a, that's just a straight up observation, and it's really hard to argue with because they have eyes too, and they can see that their org is not very full. And in fact, that's a big button for a lot of Scientologists because a lot of them have paid a lot of money with the, with the, on faith with the idea and promise that by paying all that money, their church was going to be St. Hill size, expanding, and very, very full, right? And of course, after they open these big buildings with all this fanfare, they are empty and they are ideal morgues, not ideal orgs. But don't say that to Scientologists because ideal morgues is just joke, what they call joking and degrading or J and D. And that's something that they're easily able to just, that yeah, I don't have to see that, I don't have to hear it, meh, 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 and they shut down right away. What you want to do is give them something that is going to get through to them before they shut down or get to them in such a way that they don't want to shut down. So those are some of the best ideas I could come up with off the top of my head. Maybe if I gave it more thought, I'd come up with some more, but I hope those are helpful. 26 UT. I discovered your channel six months to a year ago and have been loving it. I am a Mormon who is physically in but mentally out. Husband is still very in and we have small children and I haven't quite figured out what to do about it. It causes me a lot of stress and pain because I love him and them so much. You understand, no doubt. My question is, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints uses multiple fear tactics to keep people in. One of those being the very real fear of losing your family, which I understand to be similar, if not worse, within the Church of Scientology with its policy of disconnection. The other fear tactic that I was wondering if there is a counterpart in the Church of Scientology is that when you make covenants in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or even if you are simply obedient in keeping the commandments, you are promised certain protections and blessings. If you walk away from those promises and don't fulfill your end of the bargain, the idea is that you put yourself in Satan's power and he will be able to tempt you, torment you, and as much as possess you, ultimately leading, leading your soul away from God to destruction and damnation. Yikes. You sort of touched on this in the Three Apostates video involving the abused woman who had to climb the stairs with the knives on them in order to leave her apartment. So forgive me if I'm being forgetful, but again, I was not sure if Scientology stayed pretty much on the you'll lose your family and your job and everything else temporal side of fear tactics, or if there's a spiritual side to Scientology's scare tactics for people considering leaving the Church of Scientology. Thank you very much for the question, and I really am sorry that you're in the position that you're in, and um, man, it's a rough one. So I hope that you are able to find some um, methods or success there in talking to your husband and maybe working some things out. As far as uh, your question goes, though, it's a great question. So let's take a look at that. We've talked all about disconnection. We've talked all about physical abuses and stuff like that. And I have talked in the past about Scientology spiritual beliefs 
ad infinitum, right? But as far as the threat to leaving, okay, well, let's take a look at that. So what happens if you're a Scientologist and you're in the mindset of a Scientologist and you start thinking that you want to leave or you don't want to be part of this anymore or maybe this isn't really what you thought it was, was supposed to be and you start having all these doubts? Well, what's the threat assessment there? Well, it's a big one. Because Scientology, once you get fully indoctrinated into what it's really about and where they're trying to take you, the idea is that you as an immortal spiritual being are trapped here and that this planet is a prison planet. And not just a prison planet for our bodies, but for us as spiritual entities. We're stuck here. We can't leave, we can't get out, we don't have freedom of movement throughout the galaxy sort of thing, right? We keep getting drawn back here. I mean, Hubbard talks about doing processes where, you know, you go out and explore Mars and Jupiter and put yourself in the sun and go here and all go there, but at the end of the session, you're right back here in your body, right? There's no auditing process where you go do some grand tour of the universe and never come back. <laughs> so you always have to come back, right? And you got to go and pick your body and take it back home and put it to sleep and all that. All right, so you get this idea or you get this reality, the subjective reality that you're a spiritual entity and you buy into that. And once you bought into that, that is a extremely powerful motivator because now you're convinced that Hubbard was right about that, so he must be right about everything else. We're pretty stupid in the way we come to conclusions about stuff. And generally speaking, when we want to believe in something, we only need one instance of it working or one instance of it being the right thing or agreeing with us somehow, and we'll buy the whole package. We'll take it all. Bring it. Yeah. Okay, good. Right? All right, so I <laughs> just have to say get these little comments sometimes. All right, so um, so if you're going to start thinking about leaving now, then that what that is immediately does is it threatens your entire future forever because you've bought into this idea as a Scientologist, and I'm going to assume from the text of this question that you have really fully bought into it. This is not some guy who just walked in and is kind of wondering what's happening. This is somebody who's been around for a while. So now you're convinced that if you stop getting auditing, Scientology's form of counseling, and you stop moving up these levels of the Scientology grade chart to total freedom, that you're just going to slip back down over time. You're going to lose the gains of Scientology because you're going to get embroiled in all of the mess, the matter, energy, space, and time around you that, that, that traps you as a spiritual entity. And you're going to get stuck here and you're going to be trapped and you're going to get right back into that same endless cycle of death and birth and death and birth. And you're going to be completely, you're going to be an amnesiac because you're going to forget everything when you die and have a new body. And the whole thing, I mean, this is the thing that terrifies Scientologists, is that they're going to forget everything and they're going to have to start all over again, or they're not going to find Scientology again in their next life uh, if they don't finish in this life, right? So uh, finish getting up that bridge. So you want to get up that bridge to total freedom. And if you don't make it to the top, all the secrets are not revealed to you. I mean, OT8, the very highest level of Scientology's current bridge to total freedom, you can't go higher than OT8, the name of that level is Truth Revealed. <laughs> so, you know, you got to get all the way to the top before the full truth of everything is supposedly revealed to you. So you lose all of that. You lose any possibility of getting that, of attaining that. And as a Scientologist, your view is that the people on the internet and independent Scientologists who also deliver Scientology or talk about this stuff are a bunch of squirrels. They're people who are altering Scientology. They left. They're bad people. They've done bad things, according to Hubbard's dogma. So they can't be trusted. So it's not like you can leave the official church and then find all the goods outside of the church, that you can't believe any of those guys. They're not trustworthy, right? They're the bad guys. 
So you you would feel like you were just stuck and, and you know, you didn't have any hope at all and it was all just going to be, uh, you're just going to hell in a handbasket, right? You're dooming yourself to this eternity of, of, of what you've been through, all this trillania is what you're going to continue to be. I think I get the point, right? So, uh, so that's kind of how they look at it. And it's, uh, it generally tends to be pretty overwhelming and it causes a lot of anxiety and a lot of stress on a person when they think that their future is nothing. That there's nothing to look forward to, nothing to have or, or any of that, right? Uh, I mean, you know, what are, what's going through a person's head the day that they are incarcerated into prison for a life sentence? Right? Probably not a lot of good thoughts. Probably not a lot of happiness, right? I mean, they're, they're facing the rest of their, they're going to go to a place and they're going to die there. And they're not going to have any freedoms and they're not going to have any good times and they're not going to have anything to look forward to. Pretty sucky, right? That's where Scientologists' heads are at in, when they start contemplating leaving Scientology. This is all the stuff they think about, by the way. They don't think about the disconnection and the getting declared and stuff unless, they're, uh, unless there are uh, familial ties or important personal ties that they have. Uh, but generally speaking, this is the first line of thinking um, that they're going to engage in before they're going to go on to the other stuff. So anyway, hope that helps uh, clarify that. And uh, again, I really do wish you the best of luck with your situation. Barney Saunders, was there ever a moment when you were in the Church of Scientology that you came across an article, in print or online, that was critical of Scientology, for example, that covered the abuses or exposed the true history of L. Ron Hubbard, and that you filtered out, quote-unquote, because you were unable at that point in time to accept the facts? And what about once you had left the Church of Scientology and had started to go down the rabbit hole on the internet? Do you remember the first article you read? Did it convince you right away, or were you still skeptical of the claims made? All right, I've talked about my whole down the rabbit hole thing so many times, I'm not going to get into that a whole lot, but this question did make me think of something that I have never talked about that I thought might be interesting for you, because it was actually uh, an important point in time, and I didn't realize at the time just how important it was. So cast your mind back to 1991. And I was a class five staff member. I was a staff member at the Church of Scientology of Santa Barbara. And so I wasn't Sea Org yet. That was, that was still four years away. And I was in um, the grocery store and the Time Magazine article came out. And this is Scientology, the cult of greed. And we were all like, oh my God. And we were told, don't read it. Don't open it. Don't look at it because there's confidential information in there and it's totally off the rails. And why would you look at any of that stuff anyway? Well... I was curious and I was standing in the grocery store and I was freaking out because I wanted to look at it. I wanted that knowledge. I wanted to see it, but, and I went, you know, all these people have read it. They're still around. Nobody's dying. So I'm going to, I'm, I, I want to see what's in this thing. Right? So I opened the article and I read it and I read it all. And I, I was actually freaking out though because there was one two-page spread that laid out the OT levels and what was covered a very little brief one one or two line summary of what was covered on each of the OT levels and I was like oh my god I want to know but I can't know but I want to know but I can't know I mean I was just like oh racked with fear and doubt and indecision but I finally came over it and I looked now, I only looked at a couple of levels, and I was just, like I said, I was terrified. So I, you know, kind of looked and then averted my eyes and just like, uh, uh, and I uh, saw something about Xenu. And then on OT8, it, I distinctly remember it said something about how you come to realize that everything you've done in Scientology was uh, an illusion or was not true, and you are just... Uh, a simple little spiritual entity or some, it was something like that, or somehow it was, it communicated. I don't think it said the spiritual entity part, but I think it said the part about how you come to realize that everything you've done up to now is not real or something. So um, it kind of, I, I, I was taken by that, obviously, because I still remember it. And I was like, wow, that's weird. 
and I just thought it was weird. It was so weird, so un so not understandable to me uh, that I just kind of went, well, that just can't be true, and I immediately dismissed it. And the Xenu thing, I was terrified of. So I only saw that little tiny bit, and I just went, oh, nope, can't look at that. Got to be a good chicken, right? Because this stuff is dangerous, and it's going to kill me if I, if I get too deep into this. So I spent most of my time in the article reading the testimonials of former Scientologists who were talking about how Scientologists had taken them for a ride, ripped them off of all this money. They had mortgages on their houses now that they couldn't pay because they'd given all this money to the church and they couldn't get a refund. And, you know, that, those stories were not hard to read. I was a little bit like, well, they should just, you know, I was still thinking like a Scientologist, of course. So I was thinking it was easy for me to dismiss them too because I thought, well, those are just individual cases. Scientology overall has helped thousands of people, tens of thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people. So clearly these disaffected, you know, idiots just didn't do it right. And they have their own, what we call overts. They had their own bad deeds and that's why they were talking trash about Scientology. So, so I was able to dismiss all of it easily enough at the time but that was the first time that I'd ever heard the word Xenu or saw it in print. And once you know something like that, right, you can't unknow it. And it was like that little splinter in my mind. And that did not, that was the tiniest, I mean, I'm pointing back here to my amygdala, right? Like, okay. Uh, it was the tiniest little seed. It took years and years to grow. I mean, years, right? It was a slow process because I was all in and I was fully committed. But once it's there, you know, don't ever underestimate the power of what you can do with even a single word. It really can work. You just have to look at the time frames involved sometimes because sometimes people are a little slow in coming around to seeing other points of view. And so that was my, that was certainly the, the, the truth in my case. But, um, but eventually, you know, 20 years later, I was, I was out of there. So, um, so that's how it happened. And I thought that might be of, of interest to you. So there you go. Let's do some flash answers. Brian Torpy. Chris, has anyone ever just told Miscavige to fuck off? I know it's basically heresy, but over so many years and so much abuse, I can't imagine someone hasn't. Have you ever heard of someone doing so? The closest I have heard anybody coming close to actually doing that was my interview with Jesse Prince, where he confronted David Miscavige gun in hand and was like, oh, you want some? Okay, let's do this. And that was the only time I've ever seen somebody actually stand up fully to Miscavige. Unfortunately, Jesse was so in the mindset and so freaked out and the, and, the, and the whole thing was so traumatic that he caved shortly after and gave in to Miscavige's demands. So it was a short-lived rebellion, but it was quite impressive. So you can check out my interview with Jesse Prince and see I didn't hear all the details about that. Lamont Roos. Given how prolific a writer LRH was, did he ever write anything on his writing system? Yes, he did. Now, I have only seen a little tiny part of it. There is a magazine called Ron the Writer, which you can purchase from Bridge Publications if you want to. I am not suggesting you do so, but I'm answering your question, and that's where you can get it. Most of the information, I believe, that Hubbard wrote about writing is contained in uh, the pamphlets and materials and, uh, and teaching materials that the Writers of the Future contest has. Because when they choose a winner or winners, they bring them and they do a whole weekend workshop and they go over Hubbard's works on how to write. And they go over other stuff, of course, too, but that's part of the curriculum of the weekend. And that's the only place I know where I would go if I was looking for all of Hubbard's uh, information about how to write. I know he did do some stuff on that, and that's where I, I think it is. Adria VZ Holub. Is that a Star Trek poster behind you in your podcast? What is written on it? It looks like stars and maybe the Enterprise. I'm a total Trekkie, so I am curious. Okay, you're talking about this poster right here. And what this poster says is somewhere 
something incredible is waiting to be known. That quote is attributed to Carl Sagan, but it is not Carl Sagan's quote. Uh, just like this quote over here is attributed to A. A. Milne, and he was the writer of the Winning the Pooh uh, books, and that he didn't say that either, <laughs> but I love those quotes. So I put them back there, and I thought, uh, this will be a little critical thinking test. If you can make out what it says, and you can see who the, you know, the, the writer was, then you'll look it up and go, hey, Chris, you got that one wrong. Well, I didn't get it wrong. I just, I just like the quotes. <laughs> so uh, that's what's on my walls back there. Okay, guys, that's our show for this week. Thank you very much for coming around and listening to me. Um, if you find this entertaining, informative, and educational, consider joining me on Patreon. Uh, this is something I would very much like to grow. I would very much like to keep growing my channel here and get this information out to as many people as possible. You guys can help me with that by supporting the channel through Patreon or through individual PayPal donations. They all help uh, move the ball down the road and keep this thing going. So thanks for coming around and showing me all of your support and great comments. Leave any questions, comments, or feedback in the comment section below. I will see them all and often respond to some of them. So thanks again, and I'll see you guys next week. Bye-bye.